Now I'll introduce our speaker, Mike Judd. Mike and I go back, way back, back in the days when uh, Castle Mountain was called West Castle. <laughs> we did some uh, air ramps control together and uh, managed to live through that, uh, throwing bombs up in the high north slope. That was pretty exciting. But I also know Mike has been pretty active in the uh, you know, I, I'll keep our environment uh, so we can sustain uh, life on Earth. And he's agreed to speak today about repopulating some of the eastern slopes with the uh, bison or buffalo. So he's going to come up and tell us all about it. And then there's a little short video right after his presentation that he will that we'll try and make work so without further ado please welcome Mike Judd so just stay away from the mic a little bit don't get too close yeah to the I'll mic. try I'll try and stand okay. back as long as I can reach him yeah and this so you can, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, and so many old friends that I'm kind of gradually spotting here and there throughout the whole audience. Very nice to see so many people, and I'm really pleased to talk to you today as a member of the newly organized Foothills Bison Restoration Society. Uh, uh, an organization that I'm one of the founding members of, and there's another one sitting right here, Tony Partridge, who drove me down here today. So, um, should bison be restored to East Slope public wildlands? I know this is going to be a controversial topic. We know that, we're aware that there are many land uses happening, and particularly in the area that we're talking about. But we'd really like to explore this idea with you today. And um, what I'd like to do to start with is take you on a little journey in the Bob Creek Wildland and to tell you about how we came to this idea that we should form this society and see if we couldn't possibly bring this magnificent animal back to our public land. About a year ago, uh, just a little more than a year ago this summer, I got together with three of my conservationist friends and we did a four-day hike into the Bob Creek Wildland, an area that probably a lot of you know about, but if you don't, don't worry, I'll show you later on a map exactly where it is. Uh, kind of a diverse group of conservationists, uh, psychiatrists, a worn out outfitter, uh, ex-mountain guide that lost his arm in a helicopter accident, and an artist, a, a fairly renowned artist from the Crow's Nest Pass. The four of us got together and we did a four-day hike into up through the Bob Creek area and had a wonderful time. And um, the third day of our hike, we, we had managed to come up out of the White Creek drainage, which is on the west side, and we were on the divide looking off towards the whale back and the Bob Creek, which you can make out in the background in that picture. We were laying there having lunch, and we started talking about what it would have been like when there were wild bison in this country, and what it would have felt like to be in there amongst them and how they would have looked on the land and what would have been different and what they were doing and we came really we became really animated about thinking about that and we were asking ourselves well is there any po possibility that they could ever be back there again the next day on our way out of the out of the valley we were walking along and about to cross Bob Creek and there staring us in the face on the creek bank was this bison skull. And to me it was like 
to all of us, actually, it was like uh, some kind of a sign that we were, yes, vice, this is where they were, and um, it seemed to me like we might be on the right track to think about the possibility that we could bring them back again. I'm not a terribly spiritual person, but uh, there was something moving about that. And as we walked out of there, a great bald eagle came and circled right over the top of us like two or three times. And we all, we all looked at each other and we thought, you know what, like for a First Nations person, I'm pretty sure this would be some kind of acknowledgement that there's something that maybe we could do here. You know, uh, by the time Ed, Edward Curtis got around to photographing the Plains people, they were in a state of starvation, de poverty, and had been incarcerated and put on small reservations. They were virtually lost people. And it was all and directly because of the loss of the bison. It was The bison was their entire way of living, everything in their religion, everything they wore, everything that they had was somehow related to the bison. And of course, we can imagine that if someone suddenly took away everything that is our food source, told us that we could only live in a very small area and that they would feed us when they felt like it, we would be a pretty dejected bunch of people, too. You have to try and visualize what the, the, bi the bison graveyard would have looked like after that immense slaughter, which is considered to be one of the biggest crimes that ever happened on the North American continent. Thousands and thousands of bleaching skulls and bones lying in areas sometimes for miles at a time that were eventually gathered up by Métis people and some of the first homesteaders and shipped off to the east to kind of further the progress, further progress. I think they were made into glycerin, if I'm not mistaken. I, I can't, I'm not sure about what they were actually used for. This is one of the two most famous, most important chiefs of the Cree nation ever. And to me, this picture symbolizes what, um, excuse me. <laughs> I didn't think I'd get emotional, but I think it symbolizes the end, the, the true end for these people. Notice the size of chain that they had to, they considered efficient to keep Big Bear in. And the fact was that the reason they incarcerated him was simply because he refused to sign the white man's treaty and uh, refused to live on the, the reservation that they had selected for him, which was not at all in his original, his home territory. So uh, he's forever linked with the rebellion, thank, thanks, Bill, with the 1885 rebellion that happened and is kind of parallel with the, the Métis uprising, who also had very just reasons to uprise, in my opinion. So, the bison are gone. Key, uh, bison are a keystone species, a creature that has a disproportionately large effect on its environment. And I think everybody would agree that has ever been anywhere around bison that they have a large effect on their environment. Some of it we might see as destructive and some of it obviously is very good. Um, just along that note, the effects that bison have on their landscape has been very well documented in this book, The Ecological Buffalo by Wes Olson. And um, if you're really interested into digging how, into how this animal affects 
multiple species, birds, reptiles, insects, uh, carnivores, everything. I'd really recommend you look up this book. It's probably in the library. And uh, if you're even more interested, you could probably have Wes come and, and tell you about, tell you in great detail about the beneficial effect that bison have on the landscape. One of the things that we do know about and was studied for about a decade in Kansas where there's a fairly large herd on a fairly large piece of wildland is that they found over the course of 10 years that bison had really improved the resilience of the grassland there, that a whole bunch of new species of plants had evolved that are very much drought resistant, which in our day and age is something that we should consider because uh, the land is drying out. I live in the foothills and I can see that it's drying out and, and drought resilient plants will be important. They'll be the ones that will be here. So what you're looking at here is the good news and it's how wild bison are coming back across North America and you can see the trend of it coming from the south to the north and I have to say that the First Nations people are leading in this reintroduction that um, many, most of the, the dots that you see on there are actually on First Nation reserves and your neighbors, the Kainai Nation, have recently followed and done the same thing. My good friend Dan Fox brought 40-some bison from Elk Island National Park for the Kainai Reserve here, I think maybe two years ago now, might even only be a year. But your neighbors just across the river from you here are going to have bison and possibly you'll even be able to see them from the city of Lethbridge here. One little thing that I wanted to tell you when I started and I forgot about is literally right where we're standing and sitting at some point in time there were probably thousands of bison hooves that were right here on this very spot so to me this is this thing is encouraging um, I I was intending to point to Bob Creek on there but if you can see halfway between Banff National Park and the the blue dot on the border, that's approximately where we're thinking that an introduction could be feasible. This is a map of the area. It's the little green, the green area in the center is the Bob Creek Wildland Park. It's about 285 square kilometers or roughly if you picture the box about 28 miles long and 10 miles wide, that's about, that's roughly about what it's like. It's about 55,000 acres, I think. And it's dedicated to cattle grazing right now. There are 11 uh, grazing allotments in there, about 8,500 animal units, animal unit months. <laughs> and what that would translate to, and I asked Wes Olson about this, if he could give me a number, he said it's kind of hard until he has a look at it because bison are 1.2 animal unit months and uh, they would be there all year round. So I said, could you give me a rough estimate? I said, would it be a thousand? He said, possibly a thousand animals that would sustain. So that's a considerable herd of bison. Mm -hmm. This is out of the Bob Creek Management Plan and it has some hopeful language in it and I hope that they mean it and that is that they're willing to look at new scientific information and uh, that they're willing to change with social expectations. So the social expectations would be your part and the scientific information is what we hope we can provide by launching a feasibility study to determine a scope for if bison could be on, 
put on this land that would include if they could be contained, um, how, how they would work with the various other special interests that are involved and many more things that are yet to be determined. This is your land. This is public land. It's your land and it should be, in my opinion, managed to the best possible standard. And I have to say that Bob Creek looks pretty good. It's, I would say it looks very good, but we think that it, would, it could be better and that possibly with bison on it, it would be the best that we could do. This is a plant that I never saw before in my life, and yet tribal wars were fought over this plant because it's such an important, has been such an important food source for First Nation people. And uh, the, the time we were there, it was blooming all over in the valley, the uh, blue camas plant. I don't know how many of you people ever seen it. I think one, I see one, two. I spent my whole life in the foothills and I've never seen it, so I think, uh, you know, it has to be considered fairly rare that much of the habitat and the natural environment that it existed in is gone. So that's the question, is it time to bring them home? We, we think that it's at least time to take a serious look at that possibility to scope out what the issues are and to um, see if there's a public interest in it, to try and build momentum and to, uh, and of course, engage with First Nations people because we fully believe that they would be very much involved in management and also helping to assess and develop this plan as we go along. I think that's it. It seemed like I had more to say, but maybe not. <laughs> so uh, one thing we do have is an eight minute video that we put together this summer that was done in Bob Creek and also I uh, interviews with some First Nations people and with Wes Olson, who I mentioned with this book. <laughs> across the Great Plains of North America, from the Laramie Hills of Colorado to the American Prairie Herd of Montana to Grasslands National Park in Saskatchewan and Banff National Park in Alberta, the bison are returning to their ancestral lands. Their return is an event of great importance to the revival of the ecological, cultural and spiritual integrity of the heart of North America. My prayer is asking the Creator, giving thanks, asking the Creator to answer a prayer, a prayer to bring the bison back for the survival of our people. First Nations people and to help all other peoples in the world. I wish each and every one that's helping in this process gets the blessings to continue this great work. Anya. We're uh, standing here in the Bob Creek Wildland Provincial Park, a part of Alberta's Eastern Slopes. And as you can see, a very dynamic grassland montane landscape that's part of our foothills. And at one time was the home for thousands of buffalo over millennia, thousands of years. Bison used this landscape, were hunted by First Nations people 
and there's plenty of archaeological evidence to demonstrate that this is a natural place for them to be. You know, place bison originally were estimated in the number of 30 to 60 million animals across North America, and with another almost 200,000 wood bison living in the north. That many animals on the landscape obviously had a huge impact on everything that they shared space and time with. They're what's known as a keystone species, uh, and that term uh, comes from, if you look on a stone arch of a church or any stone building, there's a wedge-shaped stone at the top of the arch. That's the keystone. And if you take that keystone out of a stone structure, the structure collapses. Same thing happens in ecosystems. If you pull that keystone species out of the ecosystem, the ecosystem will collapse. And that's what happened in North America with the removal of plains bison. So the move now is to re-establish bison back across the historic range in as many different ecosystems as we can. If there's an opportunity that presents itself to put bison, plains bison, back in their former historic range in this province on public lands, I think we should uh, try to convince the provincial government that that's a good idea. Finding the skull in sp was very inspirational. It brought out some feelings in us that this we're truly in the ancestral home of the bison, that they've been here for thousands of years, and this landscape is, is missing. They're missing in the landscape, and why couldn't it be possible to return them to where they belong? When you think about the possibilities that could mean in terms of ecotourism, uh, opportunities for First Nations and management, cultural and spiritual events, and uh, all of the plethora of things that could come with restoring the ecosystem back to its original state would be tremendous. We lived in harmony with nature. All species, the animals, the buffalo was special, and our ancestors. Their belief was they, they were related. Those were our relations. The Creator put them there for a purpose. They're our relations, almost like our, our brothers and sisters. And the bison was put there for us to survive. So we used every part of it for our survival, our teepees, our clothing, our tools, our, what we ate in, and even our soap and everything. We, so we honored the buffalo. We even did that in our, with our songs and our our stories and our ceremonies, we honor the buffalo. So I'm seeing if they come back, maybe it will be a reminder of who we are, of, of our spirituality, of our way of life for, our, for the young people and future generations. But the bison disappeared first, you know. So to bring them back, would just be like everybody coming home to the land that they once occupied and lived in this part of the world like all of us. We want to create a world where we can share. Reconciliation is walking together. It's only going to help not only First Nations, but all people. That is what we should be all striving for, to protect the beauty of our world and to make a future for our children. That is reconciliation. The Foothills Bison Restoration Society would very much like to have the support of Albertans that believe that restoring bison to our public lands would be important for the landscape, would have economic benefits, and would be a step towards reconciliation with First Nations people. So if you feel like you could help us and support us, we would very much like to have your support and try and return this magnificent animal back to its natural habitat. Reintroduction of bison to Alberta's eastern slopes is an important step towards ecological restoration, 
reconciliation with indigenous and Métis communities, and renewing cultural and historical connections to Canada's and Alberta's post-colonial human history. Feel free to come up and ask questions now. Uh, please line up along the wall. We will uh, entertain respectful questions and uh, not too, not too large uh, preamble. Uh, and Mike, would you, would if you like to come up? <coughs> Terry Shellington. Hi, Terry. Mike, uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, wonderful scenery, and uh, I appreciate your passion. Um, I'm just wondering <clears throat> what the downside of this is. I seem to recall when we introduced, reintroduced wolves uh, to the foothills that ranchers uh, were up in arms because uh, uh, it was a threat to their, uh, their flocks. So I'm just trying to round out the discussion by hearing who would be opposed to this? Who, what's the downside? How do ranchers feel about it? Uh, or any, anyway, what's the downside and, and who would be on that side of the discussion? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and of course, it's one that we have thought about. Is that, is that on? No. Yeah. The, um, the elephant in the room, of course, is the fact that there are 11 different grazing dispositions on the Bob Creek wildland, and in order to reintroduce bison there, there would have to be some kind of an, an arrangement with the government to relocate or buy out those grazing dispositions. Now this may at this point in time sound like an impossible scenario, but there's a, an example, a very good example, just south of us in uh, Montana, and the American Prairie Reserve people have collectively bought 700 square miles of land for Montanans and have put 1,000 bison back on that land. Try and visualize that if, that if you think that that is not some successful thing for nature. And they've done this by uh, either having ranchers voluntarily relinquish grazing leases or outright buying them out off of their deeded land. And of course, there's some kickback from the ranching community in that they kind of perceive this as some threat to their, the overall lifestyle of, of ranching, which is, um, I grew up in the ranching com community and my dad was a cow rancher, so I can understand that, but really at the end of the day, with 35% of our species about to vanish off of the planet and the continual onslaught to take over whatever wild land we have left, I, th I think it is incumbent on us to make some, uh, some sacrifices to save what nature we've got left. <coughs> So my name is Mark Edel. I just came back from a road trip to the Yukon, and it was amazing on the Alaska Highway to see herds of, of bison, the, the wood bison. And there are several herds, and there's some loners, and I said, well, this is great. Then I was speaking to somebody in Whitehorse, and they're saying, well, you know, this is horrible. Uh, you know what's happening? They're displacing all our moose. So, <laughs> yeah, the hunters are not happy because the bison are displacing moose. So I'm just wondering how much research is being done, and this reintroduction to the Yukon is quite recent, and I'm just wondering who is following and what is the research and what are the outcome of this research, the benefits and the drawbacks of the introduction of the wood bison in, into Yukon? Uh, 
tell you the truth, I cannot answer that question. I have no idea, but I'm pretty sure that there are biologists that are tracking that amazing expansion of the wood bison in uh, the Yukon. And uh, there's no question about it that the, this is the biggest land mammal that we have and that they are going to have impact and some positive and some negative for sure on the environment that they are in. So uh, I think that's the best answer I can give. I, I don't know exactly how they're impacting the moose. I would be very surprised actually if they are impacting the moose population. Hello, Mike. <clears throat> I'm Violet Mi'kma. Thank you very much for that really exciting presentation. Well, it sounds very interesting. Um, I have a couple questions. I'm wondering where you get the bison from uh, that are going to be used to populate. If this goes ahead, are there any domestic bison or are they strictly from wild herds? And the other question I have is if it's going to be on public land, I assume indigenous people would have the opportunity to hunt for sustenance and for their cultural activities. And I wonder if there's been any discussion of that and uh, how that would work. Thank you. Really good questions, and I actually should have addressed those already in my presentation, but um, we have sent out a letter to all seven tribes in the uh, Treaty 7 territories uh, explaining what, what our vision is and asking them if they would like to participate with us. Mm -hmm. So far we haven't had a reply, but it's early in the game. We've also sent out uh, the same letter to the Bison Buffalo Treaty Relations people who are fac helping facilitate return bison to the First Nation lands, and uh, we haven't heard back from them yet. However, I have met Mary Eve Marchand and uh, I look forward to very much to continued discussion with all of those people. And of course, we very much see this as a joint project that would be a, a visible step towards reconciliation with First Nations people. And the way we envision it is that they would be very involved in hands-on in the management of the project and also when the time came that the herds had reached carrying capacity that they would be involved in uh, harvesting whatever they needed for their, from, that, from those herds. And also that it would be an opportunity for them to do ceremony and spiritual things on the landscape that is within Treaty 7 territory. Was there another part to the question? Where, where did the herds come from? Oh yeah, uh, yes. All of the all of the wild bison come from Elk Island National Park, so we expect that's where these would come from. They're all tested, vaccinated for uh, brucellosis and all of the other diseases that ranchers are concerned about and have made quite a big have thrown as a big stumbling block historically into bringing bison back. The truth of the matter is there's, as far as I know, never been a case where brucellosis was transferred from bison to cattle, but in fact, cattle have put brucellosis in the bison herds. Anyway, I think those fears can very much be alleviated because any bison that would be relocated on Bob Creek would be quarantined for quite a while. They would be fully vaccinated and inspected by vets and before they, they were ever released into the bigger area. Uh, hi, I'm Bev Trainer, and I'm going to just... You have to stand back. Hi, Bev Trainer. Uh, I just have a short introduction just so you know where my question's coming from. I grew up in One Four, which is the very southeastern corner of Alberta at a research station that when I was a young girl had herds of buffalo. So I lived with them for the number of years that they had them there. Now their purposes were for research purposes for crossbreeding. So it's very different than what you're talking about. But I guess where I'm coming from and what I'd like to ask is that whole large area 
of land was turned over from the federal government to the provincial government, I can't quote how many years ago, but to me it doesn't seem that long ago, and that land sustained a large herd of buffalo for several years. So I don't know what type of an arrangement might be made to introduce them back there in a different way. But, uh, but they were migratory, some of them. And the ones that you couldn't contain uh, often were found in the States. But they had come back to the research station every spring, and very often with a calf. So my question is, is that something that you might be able to look into? Well, you know, I think bison, the return of the bison is becoming much lar larger, a much larger thing than any single entity out here. We're kind of focused on the East Slopes right now and the possibility of getting some on the East Slopes. But you know, I've been, I've been on that land on one floor, I've rode along that border, I've seen First Nation teepee rings on both sides of the border there, and I've, and I've always thought, wow, what a place, can you imagine this place with bison on it? And it seems to me like absolutely their natural place to be, and such a huge intact piece of short grass prairie yet, so I definitely support the idea. And you know, if, if our organization could help in furthering that dialogue, we would certainly be willing to do that. Very good question, thank you. Hi, my name's Alex from Beaver Mines. Um, just a question I hear the talk about the, the ranchers. I'm just wondering if there's a plan to educate them to get them to switch what they're ranching. Like, if, is it easier just to ranch the bison? and get them out into the everywhere rather than just Bob Creek? Um, if not, is there gonna be a plan? And if there is, do you know what it is already? Um, that's a good question. And I think what we're talking about is two different things really. One is public, having a public resource that is belongs to the public and one is having a resource that belongs to a particular agricultural or special interest group which are two quite different things and I want to be very clear the one we're talking about is the public enterprise where the bison would be just like all of the other wild animals they would be in the collective good for all of us that all the benefits and all of the downside would be ours so um, as far as the ranching community goes, I can't speak for them. I, I simply cannot speak for them. I feel that just like in all groups of people, there are those that are very conservation-minded that would bend towards this idea, and then there are those that would not. So um, what we are hoping is that we will have that dialogue and probably through the Bob Creek Management Committee at some point where we would actually engage with the ranchers, explain that we'd like to do a feasibility study on that piece of land and that our aim is to put bison on there eventually. Um, how those negotiations could go, I, I really can't say. Klaus Jericho. Mike, I told you you're very good. I told you you're very good. Thank you for the wonderful description of your brave project. I do ask myself, is its main purpose land management? Or is it cultural management? Or is it both? And as you said earlier, the land is in fairly good state at the moment, based on its use so far. So I'm trying to decipher which avenue you should use 
to promote this project because I think it's a hell of a good idea. Pretty good question too. Um, I have to say I know Claus from date, my outfitting days when I used to take the Castle Crown people on backpacking trips along the Continental Divide and Klaus was one of those people and uh, always entertained us very much at the campfires. <laughs> uh, is it a cultural thing? Well, we see it as definitely as a cultural thing that we would want to see this as something that First Nations would be involved in from the get-go and that it would be significant in terms of a demonstration that we can share this Treaty 7 land with them on a bigger scale than we do now. And uh, what was the second part? Land management. Well, is, it, is it land management? Land, ma land management. Well, yes, I have to say that from when we saw it, that the grassland looked very good, that the, that, um, the cattle have not abused it. I can't, we can't say that. But what we could say is we don't know what's missing off our landscapes. We don't know what was there when the biggest animal on the planet roamed freely on the land. And I think this is an area that you would be really wise to have Wes Olson come and tell you exactly what they do for the ecosystem. And I guarantee you it would be different. And probably uh, there would be species there coming back gradually, plants and insects and birds and many things, even wolves. Uh, could eventually return to the landscape when, if, if, and when the bison come back. Hello, Mike. My, Graham, my name is Graham Greenlee. My question is probably a good follow-up to the one that Klaus asked. So I, I don't know how widespread the buffalo might become if they were introduced to this area. But uh, do you think it might be possible or feasible to uh, bring the head smashed in buffalo jump back into use? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> I don't, you know, um, that's a, <laughs> a good one, but. I think what we're seeing progressively and steadily is that the bison are returning to the landscape and that there is a growing public resurgence of interest in them and that sense of loss that we have, especially people that love the natural world, we're beginning to see that there's some possibility, that there is a possibility that over time, we will see a much larger landscape with these animals on it, and eventually, possibly, the, there will be some connectivity, particularly along the eastern slopes. I think it's possible over time that that would happen, that there would be a contiguous uh, migratory chain route for, for bison. It's kind of a dream, and a vision that could be a long ways down the road, but looking at the progress that's being made when we think that one entity like American Prairie Reserve has managed to save 700 square miles of land for bison and they've got a thousand there. I think there, there's possibilities. My name is Mary Shillington. Thank you for your presentation. I hadn't uh, uh, like uh, we've we've come from Manitoba where there's some bison of course and and uh, uh, we've enjoyed them so I'm looking forward to your success but part of my question thought is where's the money coming from that you are uh, are you asking for grants or are you so, some private individuals helping with support or where's the money coming from all, all your project we're wondering the same question. Uh, good, good question. 
I think you probably noticed on our little video that we have a uh, GoFundMe page. And the purpose of that is to do the first step in our project, which is to commission a feasibility study, which would require, we're roughly estimating about 30000 to $50,000. We have put this idea out to biologists. There are some very good biologists in Alberta that are looking at this. And I think that if we can answer that question, this is something that is going to happen in the future, probably in the near future. And then we'll be able to take this to the next step to whatever requires funding in that bigger picture, whether it is more public consultation or lobbying with the government or actually getting infrastructure to put on a landscape. So we're kind of looking at this as a, a series of steps. We actually funded this little film that you just saw out of our own pockets. The, the four of us funded this one, it cost us about six grand. But uh, we, f we feel that it's going to help us down the road quite a bit more than that. So, yeah, that's it. Oh, Henning. Hi, Mike. How are you? Fine. So, Henning Mundell is my name. <clears throat> my question relates to potential containment area-wise. And uh, uh, you mentioned a particular area, so part of the question is, so how will they be maintained, realizing that in many cases they are migratory or have been migratory. But I also want to use an example, and maybe you can update me on the current situation. A couple decades ago, uh, the blood tribe here was uh, keen on introducing uh, bison. We met the herdsmen often in the sauna uh, at Nicholas Sharon Pool. And I raised to him the point is so, how do you prevent them uh, from going off the reserve because they were planning to keep them on the reserve? Oh, yeah, they won't go across the Old Man River. Well, a couple months later, we see a picture in the newspaper. There they are, swimming across the Old Man River. Okay, now they've done a reintroduction. I don't know whether they're adjusting that, but what are your plans with your area? Thank you. Well, uh, obviously containment is one of the biggest issues that needs to be dealt with. And part of a feasibility study and what the scope of a feasibility study would be where natural barriers and the Bob Creek wild land would be the containment, and that would be likely the Livingston Range of mountains, and where uh, fence infrastructure would have to be built around the perimeter, which is an expensive and big undertaking, but one that is being done successfully all over where bison are being reintroduced. Um, it's it's very well known how to contain bison with with fencing nowadays, and, and Wes Olson, who has reintroduced them in Banff, in Alaska, in Russia, and I think was involved with the reintroduction on the Blood Reserve, probably has helped to update how the bison are contained there. So. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, containment is a big part of what the feasibility study would very much be looking at. And um, yeah, that's it. Sorry. Yeah, Tony just reminded me of one other significant area, and that's Grasslands National Park, which is has a very big bison herd now, and all of that is contained by simply by fencing. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Ian Hurdle, I, Henny kind of answered uh, my question, but I wondered if you could introduce them on the uh, Bobcat Range, uh, Bob Creek Range. Could you have them with cattle at the same time? Like if you fenced off part, so that would help the grazing leases, but still allow 
the bison to be on. I also have a comment that if it's anything like the wild turkeys that introduced in the porcupines, I used to see one around my property, and sometimes there's 40 or 50 together now, so I think they kind of spread. <laughs> I swear, I forgot what your question was. Could you have them on the grazing range? Oh, yeah, separate yeah. Separate them? Uh, you know, all of this is going to happen when we have done the science. I, I mean, I, I think I have a pretty good answer about that one, and that would be that it would not, it would be not wise to have the two species running together. Yeah. But uh, until we've done the feasibility study and looked at the social implications, the containment, and uh, the effect on the grasslands and how many units uh, there are for ungulates and how many there would be for bison, I don't really have those. An I don't have that answer. This is going to be up to when we get the the science back on it. Last question. It's so good to see you, Mike. <clears throat> what you probably don't know is that Mike is actually a fabulous uh, artist. He's a painter, an oil painter, and uh, I've known him for quite a few years in that regard. I, I really have to commend you for looking at reconciliation of, of our, the, the damage we did as colonialists to the indigenous peoples, and, uh, and that the indigenous peoples themselves are telling you, as it was in your film, that this would be an active part of reconciliation. As Sapa, we always put up our, our little sign at the beginning of the, of the, before the talks, saying that we, you know, we are on, on indigenous territory and so on, but we need to be doing something real. So I commend you on that. And there is, um, there's a film right now that's playing on CBC. It's um, a four or five part series called Bones of Crows, a tribute to generations of resilient indigenous women f fighting for justice, uh, just to mention part of that. But I think your idea of reintroducing the bison, getting the biologists involved is fabulous because when they reintroduce wolves to the Yellowstone Park, it actually changed everything. It, ch it changed even the geology and the riverways. It changed the biology with new species coming in. So it would be fabulous to have your study. So I think if you told people you, you need $30,000 for this study, it wouldn't be as overwhelming as looking at this and thinking, oh my goodness, how do we get all these, these different areas? But we need 30000 right now <coughs> for the study, and then we can go from there. So that would be my recommendation. Well, thank you. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Anybody got 30,000? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had some questions too, Mike, but uh, since time is up, I will let them go and uh, ask you guys to give uh, Mike a warm round of applause. Thanks for coming out. Hopefully, we'll see you next week for when we talk about something a little bit different, blood versus plasma. That should be an interesting talk. Uh, many, I think uh, it's the only way you can donate in Lethbridge now is plasma. There's no blood donations anymore. So I think it'll be an interesting talk. So please come out. Thanks a lot.